people may say things like, well, just let go and let God. Uh, <laughs> so that, you know, it's like, I think when you've been trying to have a baby for a long time, you're like, well, how else could I let go, right? I mean, it's not like most people start their fertility journey just like jumping into a reproductive endocrinologist's office trying to get an IUI. Like most people start by just trusting that their biological system is going to work. And so, um, so that's, you know, just completely not helpful. Um, people may say things like, well, when it's God's will, uh, which insinuates the, the fact that they don't have a child or that their child died was God's will. And, mm. um, you know, I think that when we get to heaven, we're going to be appalled by the things that we have claimed were God's will. Welcome back to the Practical Family Podcast. I am your host, Jennifer Bryant, and I am here with our returning guest, my friend, Rachel Lewis. Rachel, welcome back. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. I had Rachel on a couple of years ago now, but her message continues to ring true. And I wanted to bring her back because um, she is publishing a book. She's publishing a book <laughs> on, on, on grief, on loss. It's called Unexpecting Real Talk on Pregnancy Loss. And when we say real talk, we're talking about real, real talk. She gets into the nitty gritty subjects of what um, it means, the experiences of women who have lost children. Um, and, and we're looking at it from a pregnancy point of view, but I know that there's, that's not the only kind of loss. Um, and I'll let you share with our audience about that, Rachel, where, where did this, um, uh, this book begin and where do you see it going? Well, um, I would say it, it began with my second loss. Um, I started writing about loss after my first, which was a, um, ectopic pregnancy where my tube tore and I had emergency surgery. Um, and about nine months later, I had my first miscarriage. Uh, that one, I, it was just so, it was so different, uh, from the ectopic pregnancy. And I think that's really, you know, so important. Like, even if you have losses at similar gestations, they could be so very different, both physically and emotionally. And so, um, in this particular occasion, I found out that I was going to miscarry by a phone call from the nurse. Um, her only words were basically, I'm so sorry, but your HCG numbers are dropping and you are going to miscarry this baby. Um, please let us know if you bleed more than one pad in an hour. And that mm -hmm. was about it. And here I was pregnant. I was about eight weeks pregnant and, uh, didn't know what to expect really from my body. And so I knew that a lot of people to get labor started, they walk around and I thought, well, maybe that's a good way to get a miscarriage started. Um, you know, which is interesting because you're kind of fighting against your body because you don't actually want to miscarry. And so, uh, walked around and I was definitely starting to cramp up. And I told my husband, I was like, let's just stop. Let's just go to Barnes and Noble. Um, cause we were at the mall. And let's get a coffee. We'll just sit and read and maybe, um, you know, maybe we'll just do that. But my mind was so focused on loss and grief and this miscarriage that I really just wanted to find a book on the shelf that would tell me what to expect. And I found two books that day. One of them was taking charge of your, uh, taking charge of your fertility, which as it turns out is a fantastic book, but really not so much if you're in the process of miscarrying, um, cause I had already tried to take charge and it did not work. And the second book basically said how not to miscarry, which again was infuriating. <laughs> I wanted to mm -hmm. throw it across the aisle, you know, like, wow. no, <laughs> why do you have this book here? So, um, I sat there and, uh, just with my husband that day. And I thought, you know, I'm going to write that book. Like there, there needs to be a book to tell somebody what to expect. This is such a common experience. There is no justifiable reason for there not to be a resource um, mm -hmm. like this. And that was actually about nine years ago. So um, it's, it's been, it's, it's been a long time coming, um, but that is where the beginnings of the book kind of, kind of started. Wow. Rachel, you, you saw a, a need 
and it was on your heart to fill it because you were going through it at that time. Now, as someone who has experienced this, this loss, do you find that women are uh, uh, afraid to talk about it? Is it, are, are there certain um, hesitations behind sharing this kind of experience and how would you describe those? I would say in general, unless you have come forward and said that you've had a loss, um, most people are not going to talk super freely about it. Once you've come forward and said, I've had a loss, it's almost like people come out of the woodwork that say, oh, I've had a loss too. And it's this really interesting sort of phenomenon because all of a sudden you realize all of these people that you've been in relationship with have been having losses and you just didn't know it. Um, I think part of it is that whole 12 week, uh, like don't tell anybody you're pregnant because it's safe. You're not in the safe zone and you don't want to have to untell everybody, but sort of along with that means, um, you know, when you are going through some of the worst, you know, hormone changes and while you are, um, like, you know, while your body is absolutely affected, a lot of people like really struggle with morning sickness, mostly in that time frame. We as a society say, just deal with it on your own. And with that, if you have a loss, deal with it on your own. And so there's almost this shame because we've shrouded this um, early pregnancy sort of in secrecy. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think it can be very difficult to sort of broach this subject. And I think another reason for that is that it's, considered a sort of ambiguous loss for many people because uh, they don't, it's hard to fully comprehend what you've lost. Um, And that's actually part of the difficulty in grieving as well. And so because people haven't yet said hello, like your, your community, um, you know, the grandparents of this baby or the aunts or the uncles or the, you know, the godparents, they haven't yet said hello. And so saying goodbye, it just, it feels, it feels awkward and hard. And like, should I talk about it? I don't know. I don't know how to talk about it. So, um, so I would say it is a challenging topic, um, often, but then if you can find your people, if you can find people that have had loss, often they are, the most amazing community of people. I know for me finding lost mothers who just sort of had gone, had already taken the journey ahead of me and could tell me what to expect and how to cope. Like they almost became mentors in my life, um, in addition to friends. And so once you're sort of in the community, the baby loss community, it can be an incredibly supportive place. Now, I know that you started your own Facebook group, uh, support yes. group, right? Mm-hmm. And what is the name of that? And where can people find that? Um, it is called Brave Mamas, and it's on Facebook. So if you go to Facebook dot, or slash groups slash Brave Mamas, you will find it. And this group is open. It's a very diverse community. We're open to anybody who is grieving the loss of a child for any reason. So there are women that are there just, you know, facing infertility, um, which is the loss, you know, is a loss of a child in the sense that you can't have one. And so they're grieving that. And so um, all the way up to parents who have lost adult, adult children and everything in between, I've personally experienced the grief of reunifying foster children. And so, um, there are many people who relate to my experience and that are there in the group as well. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of different kinds of losses, but in the end, we try to create a really supportive place. I try to say it's the safest place to grieve your child um, mm. because we just, we really support each other and try to look not, not necessarily past our differences. We try to embrace our differences and, and um, just realize like, at the end of the day, we're all bereaved mothers. So um, anyway, so that's a really supportive community that, and again, I saw, I saw the need because there are so many groups that want to protect their members from triggers. And Mm. that can be a very beautiful thing. And there is definitely a place for that. But I was finding that I 
was struggling to find like where I belonged or, or I'd get into a group and I would not be able to have a rainbow baby, but all of the other mothers were graduating right to this pregnancy after loss group. And I was just sort of left behind. And so this group, we embrace wherever we are in our walks of life and fertility. So, um, that's sort of the niche that I sort of saw that we needed to kind of fill. Mm, wow. That's beautiful. Just that open acceptance, because yes, I hear that message in that, even if you cannot get pregnant, it's kind of, um, the, the grieving, the loss of something that will never be mm-hmm. of sorts. And, um, I know I've got quite a few friends in that boat as well. And they're all on their individual journeys of some level of acceptance, but also needing desperately that connection with other folks who really get it, Mm -hmm. folks who really get it. And that's one of my hopes today. And, and having you on the podcast is that any mama listening right now would, would know that there are women out there who really understand her and even the grief that she can express maybe some days. Um, And that's really great that you've made that available, Rachel. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about these triggers because there can be grief triggers as you call them Mm -hmm. um, and even unexpected bursts of emotion after having experienced a loss. How would you um, encourage the mama experiencing that? And then I want to talk a little bit after um, about how to support that mama. So yes, as you were saying, grief triggers, I personally found that to be one of the hardest parts about loss and about grieving is that every part of my life felt like an emotional minefield. And Mm -hmm. I just never knew when I would, like something would come up that would just, you know, absolutely devastate me. And I think, um, you know, I think we, we, as we get used to triggers, we can start to figure out a pattern sometimes of like, at least like when we think it might happen, or, um, we also might start developing some coping skills that we've realized, but initially just when it, it just literally feels like a minefield. That's how I always felt. And so, um, I'd say for the mama that is enduring these and it's sort of shocking and obviously unpleasant, um, one to say you're not alone and you're not crazy for feeling this way, uh, two, your reaction is just that it's a reaction. Um, you are not choosing these emotions. You're not choosing to, uh, as others might see it overreact, uh, Mm -hmm. you have, triggered a biological response in your brain. Um, and your brain is flooding with specific hormones and that is going to cause you to feel a certain way. And so none of this is your fault and it's not a choice. Um, you're not being too sensitive or not sensitive enough. Um, you've just literally had a a trauma trigger. So, um, I think embracing that and realizing you're not crazy and you're you're okay to feel that way. And then two, to know that you're going to survive it. Um, when you're right in the moment, it, you know, it triggers that fight, 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 freeze or fawn. It's like like tongue twister, Mm -hmm. but it, it triggers that response. Right. And it makes your, makes your body feel unsafe. And so realizing like you are going to be able to get from this moment to the next and things will calm down. Your body will calm down and it's not always going to feel this awful all the time. Mm-hmm. And so just employing some grounding techniques, I, um, I kind of refer in my book to it being a little bit like, uh, when you encounter a fire, there's like, you know, stop, drop and roll. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I say, really, if you're, if you're in the middle of the fire, you need to like leave and then stop, drop and roll. Right. You don't want to stop in the middle of a fire. Uh, and so I say, you know, you can think of that when you're in the middle of a trigger and you're just sort of trying to plan your response. So if you can escape the situation, do so get yourself out of the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, so avoid, you know, avoid if you need to, for as long as you need to. And, um, 
and that if you're in it, try, try your hardest to get out of the situation until you can calm, calm yourself down. Um, so, you know, just dropping would be like, uh, you know, using that grounding techniques of, uh, helping your body remember that it's in this present moment and it hasn't actually been transported to your past, to your trauma. Um, so reminding your body where you are looking around, labeling things. Um, what are five things I see? What are four things I feel? What are three things that I smell? Um, you know, what's, what's two things that I'm emotionally feeling What's one thing that I taste. So using that sensory to really ground yourself, um, and remind you sort of where you are. And then, um, you know, role, just having that plan of action, what's next, what can I do? Um, either, you know, next time I'm in this situation or currently, how do, how can I get myself out of it? And so I really advocate for people to come up with a plan, especially for common triggers, things like going to the grocery store and somebody asks you about your pregnant looking belly, um, or somebody asking at a social event, how many children you have. So there's some of these really common triggers and you're going to start noticing a pattern. And so then, um, you know, trying to decide how can I, how can I move forward and, and what can I do? And having that plan actually gives you a measure of control, which helps calm mm -hmm. down that trauma response. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyways, that is some things that some, someone can do when they're triggered. I hope that that was helpful and not too oh. much information. <laughs> <laughs> No, not at all. And I, I really like how you connected it because it is a very real trauma response. Um, loss, uh, especially this kind of loss, it's so connected to your body, or even if it's a foster adoptive situation, it's, it's, th there are strings there. There are invisible emotional strings that, you know, we have to change our mindset about completely. And it's not a one day thing often for women, you know, no matter what kind of, um, uh, emotional level you operate at as a woman, whether you're more highly sensitive or whether you have trouble connecting with your emotions, you know, there's something that's going to be residually there. And so you've given a great um, tips for overcoming that because of, you know, based on trauma training and um, trauma res responses, I think it's entirely appropriate in this situation. Yes. Um, so the triggers then, uh, can be anything from seeing something walking, you know, maybe down a baby, a baby aisle, it could be anything for anyone. Um, but let's talk about the triggers that that come from maybe the people that we love, folks that we're close to, oftentimes, our church community can be surprisingly triggering in many ways. Um, how how can you <laughs> uh, let's identify those things first? And then let's okay. talk to folks about how to be sensitive to bereaved or bereaving parents. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll address church first and then we can maybe broaden it out um, as far okay. as like what things are kind of triggering, but within a faith community, um, and I'm going to speak specifically to the Christian faith community and, and mostly because that's my own experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not quite as familiar with some of the other faith communities. And so, um, but at least within Christianity, there's this concept of children are blessing from God. And just that alone, if you're struggling with fertility, then there's that question, well, why is God not blessing me? Um, mm -hmm. am I not worthy of his blessing? Am I not spiritual enough? Am I not, um, have I done something wrong? And, and, um, it's a very, it, it absolutely impacts your faith experience with God. Um, at least for many people, I shouldn't say for all people, but for many people, um, that is a really difficult thing. Like you, um, you have, you have this desire, this deep desire, which is actually an innate desire, right? It's part of our biological system. And so it's not a wrong desire to want to have a baby. It's, um, it's doesn't mean you don't, you're not trusting God or you're not, um, 
you know, spiritual or anything like that to have that desire. But people being of, you know, faulty as they are, can exacerbate, exacerbate that fear in you that, um, something is wrong with you or that you're not spiritual enough, um, or that your desire to have a child is somehow worldly, um, or wrong. So people may say things like, well, just let go and let God, uh, <laughs> throw that, you know, it's like, I think when you've been trying to have a baby for a long time, you're like, well, how else could I let go? Right. I mean, it's not like most people start their fertility journey, just like jumping into a reproductive endocrinologist's office, trying to get an IUI. Like most people start by just trusting that their biological system is going to work. And so, um, so that's, you know, just completely not helpful. Um, people may say things like, well, when it's God's will, uh, which insinuates the, the fact that they don't have a child or that their child died was God's will. And, mm. um, you know, I think that when we get to heaven, we're going to be appalled by the things that we have claimed were God's will. Mm. Um, you know, to, to look at the death of a baby and say, well, that God willed that, um, that is really horrific, um, horrific thing to say to someone. And the fact is it's not necessarily true. Jesus tells us in the Lord's prayer to pray that God's will happens on earth as it does in heaven, which mm -hmm. automatically insinuates that not everything that happens on this earth is God's will. So just because it happened doesn't mean somebody can look at that and say, well, that was clearly God's will for that to happen. Um, so I would say, you know, for, if you're a supporter out there, never, ever, ever, ever say that, um, to anyone because, you know, unless it's explicitly written out in the Bible, you don't know what God's will is. So I would just never say that, um, church can also be tricky. So, so hard, hard questions. Um, but also just this focus and emphasis on family, um, you know, go to a family group, uh, like, a, you know, a small group, well, you're likely going to encounter a lot of people who are having babies, um, which can be really, really hard. Um, or even just looking at a worship, um, like a worship service, you could just see all the different people with babies or, uh, with pregnant bellies. It's just can be a really hard place. And there's just that question of like, why God, why me? Have you abandoned me? Have you betrayed me? Um, and there's not a lot of acceptance with the idea of wrestling with God in our current, you know, Christian culture. Uh, th there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves and each other to just perform for God. Um, we look at experiences like this as these tests of faith to see if we are, you know, strong enough spiritually. And the loss of a baby Maybe should never ever be considered a test of faith. Um, God is not some insecure God where he would, he would kill a child in order for him to know that you love him. Like that would be abusive, right? That's not the act of a loving God. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a lot of potentially painful things that are just kind of ingrained and inherent in the Christian culture. Um, so that has been my experience and a lot of people's experience that I've, I've talked to. Sure. Sure. Thank you for addressing that, Rachel, because I think being in whatever faith community we're in or whatever particular church culture, it can be easy to just always accept that everything that happens or is said in church is like godly right. <laughs> and we're still humans yes. or, or even still biblical. And, and we do have the freedom and now like, wow, it just became a theological thing to where it's like, well, what do I believe about God or what God says about children, about my body, about his timing, about the rightness of all of this. And, you know, whether or not you, you receive an answer in for yourself in this podcast right now, we, I think Rachel and I would both encourage you to go and, and 
check with, check in with the Lord, you know, ask those hard questions, be willing to think about something differently and not just because, oh, the church people are encouraging you to maybe get happy faster or find joy faster or something instead of being comfortable in the grieving process, because it's all part of what God's given us to cope and to get through these difficult things. Um, this grief awareness, Rachel, I think is what, what we're hitting on right now, um, whether we're aware of it for ourselves or whether others around us need to be aware of the necessary process of grief. Mm-hmm. How would you poignantly encourage someone to be there for someone who's experiencing loss. You know, you talked a little bit about what, n- what not to say, what could come across as really insensitive, but how, or what can we say in that yes. moment? Yeah, that's a really, a really great question. And I would say if I get any question, it's that it's how can I support my loved one? Um, mm-hmm. And so I'm going to give you a synopsis of this. But just to let you know, and um, all of those who are listening, um, I did create a resource and it's going to be on my website at unexpectingbook.com. And it's called How to Help a Loved One Through Baby Loss. Because it's just everything that I have wanted to say all these years. um, And it's all compiled in one place. So just briefly, I would point to the, uh, there's a quote by uh, Dr. Vanderkolk. He is the writer, or sorry, the author of The Body Keeps the Score. Mm. And he shares that social support is actually the number one sort of intervention that can determine whether an event is going to be further traumatic for the, for the individual, or if that individual will be able to heal from that event. And like, so that, that one thing is social support more than any other intervention or any other, um, you know, help or anything. So he says, well, what is social support? And he says, is this idea of reciprocity? It's this idea of being, um, seen, being heard, uh, being held in the safety of someone else's mind and just having that visceral feeling of safety. And so, um, rather than giving a lot of, uh, you know, very specific things to say, and then very specific things not to say, um, I chose to embrace this chapter is just very principle based because I think more than anything, people who are in that situation, if they are cognizant and aware enough to ask that question, how can I help a loved one? they desperately want to get it right. Right. Like they desperately want to love their loved one well. And what can be absolutely paralyzing is this idea. There is a long list of things not to do. Um, Sure. And and then a long list of things to do. And all of that can just like when you're in the moment, it can just be too much. So what I did is I took Dr. Vander Kolk's uh, definition of being ser- being seen, being heard, being held, and having that visceral feeling of safety as like the principles that you can use and you can ask yourself, am I seeing my loved one? So if you're seeing your loved one, then you're, you know, you're, you're acknowledging what's happening, what has happened to them. And you're affirming to them how they are experiencing this. So you're not challenging them. You're not saying you should be experiencing it this way. You're saying, I want to know how you're experiencing this. Um, You're hearing them. So you're not talking 80% of the time. Um, You're choosing your words carefully. You are allowing them to inform you about this experience and uh, you're not trying to give advice. You're just there to hold their experience, right? Like hold space for it. That's all you're there for. You do not have to come up with anything brilliant. I, if I could let anybody off the hook, it would be to say, you don't have to come up with the reason for this loss. You don't have to say something comforting. You don't have to soothe them. 
and you don't have to make this loss. Okay. So there Mm. is no pressure on you to fix any part of this. Mm. Really what you can do is you could just enter into the space and create that visceral feeling of safety. You can, if you're going to hold them, you can hold their hand, you can hold their shoulder. Um, You can hold space for their emotions and allow their emotions to just exist unchallenged. And then you can create that visceral feeling of safety by actually helping them with their physical, you know, body and environment. So Mm -hmm. are you making sure that they're fed? Are you making sure that their home is a calm, peaceful place? Um, Are you helping them? you know, with other tangible things like childcare or like picking up the kids from school? Are you doing things to help them simplify their environment? Um, I kind of explained this as um, kind of like when somebody has a wound um, and they come up to you and, you know, you've got your first aid kit uh, as somebody helping somebody else who's got, you know, a, a cut or whatever, like it's not your job to heal this is, you know, the, the wound or whatever, it's your job to help create an environment in which healing is possible. Mm. So it's your job to help them, you know, clean the wound out, put some neosporin out, you know, on help cover that wound so that there's not, um, you know, dirt and germs getting in there to help it get infected. Like you're, you're protecting that wound and you're creating an environment in which it is possible for their own body to heal. And so I, I think if you just hold that thought in, um, you know, in your mind, like, am I creating an environment for this person in which healing can be possible? Mm, that's a great picture. I love, I like that. And it, I hope it keeps folks from feeling like they need to center themselves in someone else's grief, right? Mm-hmm. For you just to affirm that, All you need to do is be there. It it feels kind of easier said than done for folks who are used to fixing things a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening right now and you're like, oh yeah, I tend to be the kind of mama or the kind of woman or the kind of auntie or helper or grandma who just wants to make it better. But I just want to make you better. I I just want to make sure that you're okay. And all of these things at once can actually be very, very too much. Mm -hmm. for someone Mm -hmm. than just what you're describing, Rachel, and just allowing them to have their feelings and their grief Mm -hmm. with you, knowing that you're not going to bombard them. Wow. Well, you know that what, what makes an experience traumatic is experiencing it within a sense of not having control, but then also experiencing it within a sense of being alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why that social support is so important and so worthy of, of, you know, making sure that, that, that happens for people. Um, and then I would say too, just know that you don't have to be everything. Um, if you think that it's your job to provide meals and provide childcare and do, you know, and do this and do that, like, and you're doing that to the detriment of taking care of yourself. Um, it's actually going to be more detrimental. So take stock of what you can do and operate from your strengths. Um, I mean, if I could, if I could say anything that would be that if you show up to someone's grief space and I've done it, I've made this mistake. Um, I showed up to the hospital. My, my friend had just delivered her dead baby and Mm -hmm. I had been trying to do everything because I didn't, you know, I didn't want any piece of her support to be dropped. And so, so it, it ran me ragged. And so when I came and did the most important thing, which was to sit with her, I was frazzled. You know, I was hungry. I was frazzled. I was tired. I was stressed. Um, and I couldn't be the most important thing for her that she needed for me in that moment. And so really take inventory, you know, take care of yourself. Um, this is not, this is not something where I'm telling anybody to run themselves ragged or to um, sacrifice to the detriment of themselves. So take care of yourself and, and then give from, you know, give from 
your strengths and what you're good at? Mm. So if you're good at food, make her yes. some food. Yeah. Or if, <laughs> it's you know, simple as that. yeah. And if you are, mm-hmm. if you are good at organizing, like maybe you were mm-hmm. terrible at sitting and letting somebody cry, mm-hmm. but you are sure. really good at organizing. <laughs> Okay, offer to help organize the funeral or offer mm. to do a given kind or a meal train so that you can organize people's support. Um, so there's there's definitely a place for you no matter what you are good at. You are never, you know, to anything to help somebody else. You're never too far away from a situation um, or a person um, to just say like, just to be open to helping somebody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. That's good. Now, um, as we wrap up, I don't want to um, forget often the other part of this equation. And that's often the men, the husbands, the, the partners involved in this loss. Can you talk to us a little bit about how men tend to experience this loss differently? Um, yes. And how to support that as well. Yes. Um, I, I do have a chapter on that in my book. Um, and I've gotten a lot of feedback so far from early readers because there's just so little, you know, there's so few resources on how men grieve, especially the loss of a baby. So, um, the first thing I would say is that, um, typically grief in general is counter to a Western cultural identity of masculinity. And Mm. so, uh, from the very beginnings of, uh, you know, infancy, uh, boys are getting messages about what it is to be a man and it's sort of ingrained in their bodies. And, and, um, I go through in my book, each one of those, um, you know, messages that you get and then how pregnancy loss specifically challenges that. Um, and so for instance, uh, one of the ideas, uh, for masculine men, you know, culturally masculine is Mm -hmm. that they always have an immediate answer. So think of like, think of like Jack, uh, Jack Bauer, if I don't know if you've Mm -hmm. ever watched 24, he is like the, (laughs) yeah, he is like the epitome of all the things that cultural masculinity is. Um, but you know, think about it. if he's in this situation, he's always, he's, he's always the, the right, um, the right guy for the situation. Like he's, he's always got the answer. Right. Um, and, and that is one of these ideas that, I'm, that a man, no matter what the situation, they should always be able to be able to problem solve, but two, they should also make sure that they are never the problem. Mm. And so when you get to grief, um, what it turns out is that research shows that men, when they are encountering a loss like that, they're often their very first emotional response is to freeze. And so here they are biologically frozen in a sense of like, this is the trauma response that, that most often happens that they can't think of what next to do. They can't think of how to fix the situation. They can't, there's, there's nothing to fix. Um, and so immediately right away, they're coming across this. I have held this value or I've been taught this value my entire life that if I were in a situation like this, I would have an answer. But then here I am on the other hand, having absolutely no control and feeling completely frozen. Um, so right away, you know, the, the stage is set for this really conflicting emotional response in men. And it's also a very ambiguous grief. Like we talked about not really knowing what was lost. Um, men tend to have a more ambiguous relationship, mostly because it's not a visceral one. They're not the ones holding the child. Their bodies haven't been impacted um, as a woman's has. And so, um so what, what can happen with partners is that a woman can look at her, her partner and her partner is trying to uphold this masculine identity. Um, but she wants, she, you know, she might want him to cry with her 
or to be as upset as she is or to be as dismantled by the loss. Um, so a man can feel that his partner, his significant other is just constantly telling him to man down, to get more in touch with his emotions, to come to a support group, um, you know, while at the same time internally bat battling this cultural expectation to man up. Um, mm. and, and so, so that can be incredibly challenging. And the other thing I found was that men and women tend to have different styles of grief. And I, I say tend because gender could be a box. I don't, I'm not intending to generalize so much that I would say that women are this way and men are this way, like a hundred percent. Um, right. We're different. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you were to look at a continuum, um, men tend to have, um, a more instrumental style of grief. And an instrumental style of grief asks things like, what do I think about my loss? And it's, and the way that you kind of like meet a need is to do something, to go for a run, to have a project at work, um, to saw, <laughs> you know, to build something, mm -hmm. um, to like tangibly do something. And women, on the other hand, have this intuitive, tend to have an intuitive style of grief where how do I, you know, it's more like, how do I feel about my loss? Who can I connect with over these feelings? And so um, obviously you can have, you know, aspects of each, you know, you can, I started a blog that's very instrumental, but it was exploring how I was feeling through my loss. So that's very intuitive. So there's definitely some crossover. But the important thing is to start to recognize what it what is your style and then to start recognizing what is your partner's style and how are they different? But then also affirming that each style they have found in research is just as valid as mm -hmm. the other. So just because your partner isn't going to a support group and he's out in the shop woodworking doesn't mean that he is not. It, you know, addressing his grief. Right, right. Oh, so important to understand, Rachel, because marriages, right, have broken up over this kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. difficult. It, the loss of a child is, <clears throat> excuse me, the loss of a child I hear is one of the the main reasons why why divorce can't happen, because we're experiencing this kind of thing totally differently. Um, when in fact, it is it is not that different. It just looks different. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for addressing that. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, um, uh, to see what women uh, think about that, that part of your book and, and how to make all those things make, make sense for their own experience. Um, this is a book that needs to be available in doctor's offices. And I'm glad that we're talking about these um, just this general gr grief awareness, because so many times I hear women say, you know, I tried to ask my doctor about this and that, but they didn't quite know how to support me or they didn't know how to, where to point me or anything like that. But, but if practitioners, if, if midwives, if anyone who deals directly with women who lose children um, in, in this arena could get their hands on this book, um, I, I would love to see that. So if you're listening and you want to pick up this book, um, it's available on Amazon, um, at christianbook.com, right? Wherever books are sold. And uh, you could certainly visit Rachel's website. Can you tell us where uh, they can find those resources again, Rachel? Um, yes. Excuse me. It is um, unexpectingbook.com. I'll just show you the cover. So that way it's a little bit easier for people who are visual. Um, and right now, the cheapest place to get it, just because I am all about a deal, <laughs> like I don't ever want to pay more than I have to. So um, until August 10th, it's 40% off and free shipping at Baker Book House. And that link is on the unexpectingbook.com website. So if you go to the Baker Book House, click on the icon, that will take you to the cheapest place to buy the book. 
Wonderful. Wonderful. So again, this book is called Unexpecting Real Talk on Pregnancy Loss. And we're here with author Rachel Lewis. You can find her at Brave Mamas as well, her her Facebook group. Um, She's got a presence there on Facebook and she talks often about these issues. um, And please, please go and and find her or pick up this book, um, maybe for someone who has experienced a loss as well, but um, just getting through it, getting through it. And this is a safe place to ask questions like, am I still a parent if my baby has passed? Um, Or I know that this isn't my fault, or maybe I'm having trouble getting to that point, believing that it's not my fault. How can I get through this? Rachel gives very practical, but very, um, sensitive advice to, to bereaved mamas. So um, thank you for listening and watching this podcast and please share with anyone um, that you think of who might need to hear this message. Thank you, Rachel, for coming on today. It was my pleasure to be on. Thanks for watching the Practical Family Podcast. Can you do me a quick favor before you leave? Hit the like button so that more videos like this pop up in your feed. If you want to keep following Practical Family for more tips and tricks and encouragement for moms just like you, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the little bell notification next to it so that you're notified when new content comes out. Visit practicalfamily.org for more resources on how you can breathe easier as you embrace motherhood. This has been Jennifer Bryant. Thank you for visiting and come visit us again soon.